Beacon lights from the 19th century for our age. The 19th century was known for the rise of many ideologies and social structures that even today have a great impact on our lives, regardless of where we live and what place we call home. I have become ever more skeptical about many of the ideas from the 19th century for many reasons. But today I want to share with you a lengthy portion from a lecture that was given by the renowned and even minded scholar John Lord. John Lord was an esteemed American historian and lecturer, who gained widespread recognition for his remarkable scholarly acumen in the 19th century. Born in 1810 in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Lord pursued a rigorous education, earning degrees from Dartmouth College and Andover Theological Seminary. His intellectual prowess was epitomized in his celebrated lecture series from 1866 to 1876, which were subsequently published as Beacon Lights of History. This magnum opus, comprising fourteen volumes, showcased Lord's extraordinary ability to synthesize vast historical narratives into engaging and accessible accounts. His lectures captivated audiences with their vivid portrayals of prominent figures and critical events, spanning from ancient civilizations to the modern era, reflecting his commitment to both scholarship and public enlightenment. Lord's work, situated within the broader intellectual and cultural milieu of 19th century America, continues to be appreciated for its historical insight, and enduring impact on the popular understanding of history. The specific extract I will be reading to you comes from Volume 6, which discusses the Renaissance and Reformation. These particular insights focus on a subject that was very dear to his own experience and that of his American audiences back then. When you consider the insights presented by John Lord to us today, you will be amazed by how poignant it still is for understanding our age. His insights foreshadowed many of our current age's efforts to overcome the great calamities of the 20th century. And when I am talking about calamities, I am not only pointing to the two great wars that we know as World War I and World War II. I am also talking about our resources and monetary calamities, like the Great Depression and the various fossil fuel resource crises, let alone personal and social calamities. I dare to argue that if the secularization of the age of reason did not overwhelm most intellectual and basic social life, the words and warnings of John Lord would have helped to heal many more moral scars our current age is still grappling with. In this mid-nineteenth century lecture by John Lord, we pick up from a description of the founding of the New World by Spain and other European empires. He shows deep insight into the fact that the New World was colonized while Europe itself was still only starting out on its journey of gaining independence from authoritarian rule by both the Catholic Church and imperial monarchs. It is as if, like most freedom-seeking New Worlders, that include the Americans, Afrikaners Australians, and New Zealanders, he saw the imperial nature of European colonization for what it really was. In this extract from his lecture, he warns of the potential dangers facing America's future and I dare to say all freedom-seeking peoples of the world. Despite the US's growing material wealth in the 19th century onwards, the nation risks corruption and ruin, a fate shared by past empires. But today we can say hopefully not the fate of truly freedom-seeking communities. Lord argues that America must cultivate spiritual and intellectual forces to prevent such an outcome. In his time, he saw what was wrong with the way we value things. Like his secular contemporaries, he also saw what real value is, but he managed to contrast it against greedy speculations on commodities like gold and silver. However, and most importantly, he acknowledges the moral consequences of America's discovery, America's modernization, and industrialization, including its secularization, demoralizing speculations, mistreatment of indigenous people, and the introduction of African slavery, which at that stage, caused the American Civil War and the abolition of slavery in the very age this lecture was given. However, he credits the arrival of liberty-seeking settlers, such as the Puritans, for establishing new social and political systems. Lord believes America's destiny extends beyond material expansion, offering the world valuable innovations in liberty, religion, and societal improvement. 
please consider for your edification the words of John Lord. It would be interesting to show how the sudden accumulation of wealth by Spain led to luxury, arrogance, and idleness, followed by degeneracy and decay, since those virtues on which the strength of man is based are weakened by sudden wealth. Industry declined in proportion as Spain became enriched by the precious metals. But this inquiry is foreign to my object. A still more interesting inquiry arises, how far the nations of Europe were really enriched by the rapid accumulation of gold and silver. The search for the precious metals may have stimulated commercial enterprise, but it is not so clear that it added to the substantial wealth of Europe, except so far as it promoted industry. Gold is not wealth, it is simply the exponent of wealth. Real wealth is in farms and shops and ships, in the various channels of industry, in the results of human labor. So far as the precious metals enter into useful manufactures, or into articles of beauty and taste, they are indeed inherently valuable. Mirrors, plate, jewelry, watches, gilded furniture, the adornments of the person, in an important sense, constitute wealth, since all nations value them, and will pay for them as they do for corn or oil. So far as they are connected with art, they are valuable in the same sense as statues and pictures, on which labor has been expended. There is something useful, and even necessary, besides food and raiment and houses. The gold which ornamented Solomon's temple, or the Minerva of Phidias, or the garments of Leo X, had a value. The ring which is a present to brides is a part of a marriage ceremony. The golden watch, which never tarnishes, is more valuable inherently than a pewter one, because it remains beautiful. Thus, when gold enters into ornaments deemed indispensable, or into manufactures which are needed, it has an inherent value, it is wealth. But when gold is a mere medium of exchange, its chief use, then it has only a conventional value, I mean, it does not make a nation rich or poor, since the rarer it is the more it will purchase of the necessaries of life. A pound's weight of gold, in ancient Greece, or in medieval Europe, would purchase as much wheat as twenty pounds weight will purchase today. If the mines of Mexico or Peru or California had never been worked, the gold in the civilized world 300 years ago would have been as valuable for banking purposes, or as an exchange for agricultural products, as 20 times its present quantity, since it would have bought as much as 20 times the quantity will buy today. Make diamonds as plenty as crystals, they would be worth no more than crystals, if they were not harder and more beautiful. Make gold as plenty as silver, it would be worth no more than silver, except for manufacturing purposes it would be worth no more to bankers and merchants. The vast increase in the production of the precious metals simply increase the value of the commodities for which they were exchanged. A laborers can purchase no more bread with a dollar today than he could with five cents 300 years ago. Five cents were really as much wealth 300 years ago as a dollar is today. Wherein, then, has the increase in the precious metals added to the wealth of the world, if a twentieth part of the gold and silver now in circulation would buy as much land, or furniture, or wheat, or oil 300 years ago as the whole amount now used as money will buy today. Had no gold or silver mines been discovered in America, the gold and silver would have appreciated in value in proportion to the wear of them. In other words, the scarcer the gold and silver the more the same will purchase of the fruits of human industry. So, industry is the wealth, not the gold. It is the cultivated farms and the manufacturers and the buildings and the internal improvements of a country which constitute its real wealth, since these represent its industry the labor of men. Mines, indeed, employ the labor of men, but they do not furnish food for the body, or raiment to wear, or houses to live in, or fuel for cooking, or any purpose whatever of human comfort or necessity, only a material for ornament, which I grant as wealth, so far as ornament is for the welfare of man. The marbles of ancient Greece were very valuable for the labor expended on them, either for architecture or for ornament. Gold and silver were early selected as useful and convenient articles for exchange, like banknotes, and so far have inherent value as they supply that necessity. But if a fourth part of the gold and silver in existence would supply that necessity, the remaining three-fourths are as inherently valueless as the paper on which banknotes are printed. Their value consists in what they represent of the labors and industries of men. Now Spain ultimately became poor, in spite of the influx of gold and silver from the American mines, because industries of all kinds declined. People were diverted from useful callings by the mighty delusion which gold discoveries created. These discoveries had the same effect on industry, which is the wealth of nations, as the support of standing armies has in our day. They diverted men from legitimate callings. The miners had to be supported like soldiers, and, worse, the sudden influx of gold and silver intoxicated men and stimulated speculation. An army of speculators do not enrich a nation, since they rob each other. They cause money to change hands, they do not stimulate industry. They do not create wealth, they simply make it flow from one person to another. 
but speculations sometimes create activity and enterprise, they inflame desires for wealth, and cause people to make greater exertions. In that sense the discovery of American mines gave a stimulus to commerce and travel and energy. People rushed to America for gold, these people had to be fed and clothed. Then farmers and manufacturers followed the gold hunters, they tilled the soil to feed the miners. The new farms which dotted the region of the gold diggers added to the wealth of the country in which the mines were located. Colonization followed gold digging. But it was America that became enriched, not the old countries from which the miners came, except so far as the old countries furnished tools and ships and fabrics, for doubtless commerce and manufacturing were stimulated. So far, the wealth of the world increased, but the men who returned to riot and luxury and idleness did not stimulate enterprise. They made others idle also. The necessity of labor was lost sight of. And yet if one country became idle, another country may have become industrious. There can be but little question that the discovery of the American mines gave commerce and manufacturers and agriculture, on the whole, a stimulus. This was particularly seen in England. England grew rich from industry and enterprise, as Spain became poor from idleness and luxury. The silver and gold, diffused throughout Europe, ultimately found their way into the pockets of Englishmen, who made a market for their manufactures. It was not alone the precious metals which enriched England, but the will and power to produce those articles of industry for which the rest of the world parted with their gold and silver. What has made France rich since the Revolution? Those innumerable articles of taste and elegance fabrics and wines for which all Europe parted with their specie, not war, not conquest, not mines. Why till recently was Germany so poor? Because it had so little to sell to other nations, because industry was cramped by standing armies and despotic governments. One thing is certain that the discovery of America opened a new field for industry and enterprise to all the discontented and impoverished and oppressed Europeans who emigrated. At first, they emigrated to dig silver and gold. The opening of mines required labor, and miners were obliged to part with their gold for the necessaries of life. Thus, California in our day has become peopled with farmers and merchants and manufacturers, as well as miners. Many came to America expecting to find gold, and were disappointed, and were obliged to turn agriculturists, as in Virginia. Many came to New England from political and religious motives. But all came to better their fortunes. Gradually the United States and Canada became populated from east to west and from north to south. The surplus population of Europe poured itself into the wilds of America. Generally, the emigrants were farmers. With the growth of agricultural industry were developed commerce and manufactures. Thus, materially, the world was immensely benefited. A new continent was open for industry. No matter what the form of government may be, I might almost say no matter what the morals and religion of the people may be, so long as there is land to occupy, and to be sold cheap, the continent will fill up, and will be as densely populated as Europe or Asia, because the natural advantages are good. The rivers and the lakes will be navigated, the products of the country will be exchanged for European and Asiatic products, wealth will certainly increase and increase indefinitely. There is no calculating the future resources and wealth of the new world, especially in the United States. There are no conceivable bounds to their future commerce, manufactures, and agricultural products. We can predict with certainty the rise of new cities, villas, palaces, material splendor, limited only to the increasing resources and population of the country. Who can tell the number of miles of new railroads yet to be made, the new inventions to abridge human labor, what great empires are destined to rise, what unknown forms of luxury will be found out, what new and magnificent trophies of art and science will gradually be seen, what mechanism, what material glories, are sure to come. This is not speculation. Nothing can retard the growth of America in material wealth and glory. The splendid external will call forth more panegyrics than the old Roman world which fancied itself eternal. The tower of the new Babel will rise to the clouds and be seen in all its glory throughout the earth and sea. No Fourth of July order ever exaggerated the future destinies of America in a material point of view. No spread-eagle politician even conceived what will be sure to come. And what then? Grant the most indefinite expansion, the growth of empires whose splendor and wealth and power shall utterly eclipse the glories of the old world. All this is probable. But when we have dwelt on the future material expansion, when we have given wings to imagination and feel that even imagination cannot reach the probable realities in a material aspect, then our predictions and calculations stop. Beyond material glories we cannot count with certainty. The world has witnessed many powerful empires which have passed away and left not a rack behind. What remains of the antediluvian world? not even a spike of Noah's Ark, larger and stronger than any modern ship. What remains of Nineveh, of Babylon, of Thebes, of Tyre, of Carthage, those great centers of wealth and power? What remains of Roman greatness even, 
except in laws and literature and renovated statues. Remember there is an undeviating uniformity in the past history of nations. What is the simple story of all the ages? Industry, wealth, corruption, decay, and ruin. What conservative power has been strong enough to arrest the ruin of the nations of antiquity? Have not material forces and glories been developed and exhibited, whatever the religion and morals of the fallen nations? Cannot a country grow materially to a certain point, under the most adverse influences, in a religious and moral point of view? Yet for lack of religion and morals the nations perished, and their Babel towers were buried in the dust. They perished for lack of true conservative forces, at least that is the judgment of historians. Nobody doubts the splendor of the material glories of the ancient nations. The ruins of Baalbek, of Palmyra, of Athens, prove this, to say nothing of history. The material glories of the ancient nations may be surpassed by our modern wonders, but yet all the material glories of the ancient nations passed away. Now if this is to be the destiny of America, an unbounded material growth, followed by corruption and ruin, then Columbus has simply extended the realm for men to try material experiments. Make New York a second Carthage, and Boston a second Athens, and Philadelphia a second Antioch, and Washington a second Rome, and we simply repeat the old experiments. Did not the Romans have nearly all we have, materially, except our modern scientific inventions? But has America no higher destiny than to repeat the old experiments, and improve upon them, and become rich and powerful? Has she no higher and nobler mission? Can she lay hold of forces that the old world never had, such as will prevent the uniform doom of nations? I maintain that there is no reason that can be urged, based on history and experience, why she should escape the fate of the nations of antiquity, unless new forces arise on this continent different from what the world has known, and which have a conservative influence. If America has a great mission to declare and to fulfill, she must put forth altogether new forces, and these not material. And these alone will save her and save the world. It is mournful to contemplate even the future magnificent material glories of America if these are not to be preserved, if these are to share the fate of ancient wonders. It is obvious that the real glory of America is to be something entirely different from that of which the ancients boasted. And this is to be moral and spiritual, that which the ancients lacked. This leads me to speak of the moral consequences of the discovery of America, infinitely grander than any material wonders, of which the world has been full, of which every form of paganism has boasted, which nearly everywhere has perished, and which must necessarily perish everywhere, without new forces to preserve them. In a moral point of view scarcely anything good immediately resulted, at least to Europe, by the discovery of America. It excited the wildest spirit of adventure, the most unscrupulous cupidity, the most demoralizing speculation. It created jealousies and wars. The cruelties and injustices inflicted on the Indians were revolting. Nothing in the annals of the world exceeds the wickedness of the Spaniards in the conquest of Peru and Mexico. That conquest is the most dismal and least glorious in human history. We see in it no poetry, or heroism, or necessity, we read of nothing but its crimes. The Jesuits, in their missionary zeal, partly redeemed the cruelties, but they soon imposed a despotic yoke, and made their religion pay. Monopoly scandalously increased, and the new world was regarded only as spoil. The tone of moral feeling was lowered everywhere, for the nations were crazed with the hope of sudden accumulations. Spain became enervated and demoralized, on America itself the demoralization was even more marked. There never was such a state of moral degradation in any Christian country as in South America. Three centuries have passed, and the low state of morals continues. Contrast Mexico and Peru with the United States, morally and intellectually. What seeds of vice did not the Spaniards plant? How the old natives melted away. And then, to add to the moral evils attending colonization, was the introduction of African slaves, especially in the West Indies and the southern states of North America. Christendom seems to have lost the sense of morality. Slavery more than counterbalances all other advantages together. It was the stain of the 17th and 18th centuries. Not merely slaves, but the slave trade, increased the horrors of the frightful picture. America became associated, in the minds of Europeans, with gold hunting, slavery, and cruelty to Indians. Better that the country had remained undiscovered than that such vices and miseries should be introduced into the most fertile parts of the New World. I cannot see that civilization gained anything, morally, by the discovery of America, until the new settlers were animated by other motives than a desire for sudden wealth. When the country became colonized by men who sought liberty to worship God, men of lofty purposes, willing to undergo sufferings and danger in order to plant the seeds of a higher civilization, then there arose new forms of social and political life. Such men were those who colonized New England. And, say what you will, in spite of all the disagreeable sides of the Puritan character, 
It was the Puritans who gave a new impulse to civilization in its higher sense. They founded schools and colleges and churches. They introduced a new form of political life by their town meetings, in which liberty was nurtured, and all local improvements were regulated. It was the autonomy of towns on which the political structure of New England rested. In them was born that true representative government which has gradually spread towards the West. The colonies were embryo states, states afterwards to be bound together by a stronger tie than that of a league. The New England states, after the War of Independence, were the defenders and advocates of a federal and central power. An entirely new political organization was gradually formed, resting equally on such pillars as independent townships and independent states, and these represented by delegates in a national center. So we believe America was discovered, not so much to furnish a field for indefinite material expansion, with European arts and fashions, which would simply assimilate America to the old world, with all its dangers and vices and follies, but to introduce new forms of government, new social institutions, new customs and manners, new experiments in liberty, new religious organizations, new modes to ameliorate the necessary evils of life. It was discovered that men might labor and enjoy the fruits of industry in a new mode, unfettered by the restraints which the institutions of Europe imposed. America is a new field in which to try experiments in government and social life, which cannot be tried in the older nations without sweeping and dangerous revolutions, and new institutions have arisen which are our pride and boast, and which are the wonder and admiration of Europe. America is the only country under the sun in which there is self-government, a government which purely represents the wishes of the people, where universal suffrage is not a mockery. And if America has a destiny to fulfill for other nations, she must give them something more valuable than reaping machines, palace cars, and horse railroads. She must give, not only machinery to abridge labor, but institutions and ideas to expand the mind and elevate the soul, something by which the poor can rise and assert their rights. Unless something is developed here which cannot be developed in other countries, in the way of new spiritual and intellectual forces, which have a conservative influence, then I cannot see how America can long continue to be the home and refuge of the poor and miserable of other lands. A new and better spirit must vivify schools and colleges and philanthropic enterprises than that which has prevailed in older nations. Unless something new is born here which has a peculiar power to save, wherein will America ultimately differ from other parts of Christendom. We must have schools in which the heart as well as the brain is educated, and newspapers which aspire to something higher than to fan prejudices and appeal to perverted tastes. Our hope is not in books which teach infidelity under the name of science, nor in pulpits which cannot be sustained without sensational oratory, nor in journals which trade on the religious sentiments of the people, nor in Sabbath school books which are an insult to the human understanding nor in colleges which fit youth merely for making money, nor in schools of technology to give an impulse to material interests, nor in legislatures controlled by monopolists, nor in judges elected by demagogues, nor in philanthropic societies to ventilate unpractical theories. These will neither renovate nor conserve what is most precious in life. Unless a nation grows morally as well as materially, there is something wrong at the core of society. As I have said, no material expansion will avail, if society becomes rotten at the core. America is a glorious boon to civilization, but only as she fulfills a new mission in history, not to become more potent in material forces, but in those spiritual agencies which prevent corruption and decay. An infidel professor, calling himself a savant, may tell you that there is nothing certain or great but in the direction of science to utilities, even as he may glory in a philosophy which ignores a creator and takes cognizance only of a creation. As I survey the growing and enormous moral evils which degrade society, here as everywhere, in spite of Bunker Hills and Plymouth Rocks, and all the windy declamations of politicians and philanthropists, and all the advance in useful mechanisms, I am sometimes tempted to propound inquiries which suggest the old, mournful story of the decline and ruin of states and empires. I ask myself, why should America be an exception to the uniform fate of nations, as history has demonstrated? Why should not good institutions be perverted here, as in all other countries and ages of the world? Where has civilization shown any striking triumphs, except in inventions to abridge the labors of mankind and make men comfortable and rich? Is there nothing before us, then, but the triumphs of material life, to end as mournfully as the materialism of antiquity? If so, then Christianity is a most dismal failure, is a defeated power, like all other forms of religion which failed to save. But is it a failure? Are we really swinging back to paganism? Is the time to be hailed when all religions will be considered by the philosopher as equally false and equally useful? Is there nothing more cheerful for us to contemplate than what the old pagan philosophy holds out, man destined to live like brutes or butterflies, and pass away into the infinity of time and space, like inert matter, decomposed, absorbed, and entering into new and everlasting combinations? Is America to become like Europe and Asia in all essential elements of life? 
has she no other mission than to add to perishable glories? Is she to teach the world nothing new in education and philanthropy and government? Are all her struggles on behalf of liberty in vain? We all know that Christianity is the only hope of the world. The question is whether America is or is not more favorable for its healthy developments and applications than the other countries of Christendom are. We believe that it is. If it is not, then America is only a new field for the spread and triumph of material forces. If it is, we may look forward to such improvements in education, in political institutions, in social life, in religious organizations, in philanthropical enterprise, that the country will be sought by the poor and enslaved classes of Europe more for its moral and intellectual advantages than for its mines or farms, the objects of the Puritan settlers will be gained, and the grandeur of the discovery of a new world will be established. What sought they thus afar? Bright jewels of the mine? The wealth of seas, the spoils of war? They sought for faith's pure shrine. A, call it holy ground. The soil where first they trod. They've left unstained what there they found, freedom to worship God.